help us with the nuances of uh, how to apply the then they apply the wrong equation. So it is much easier to use a treatment which works in all the subgroups of patients, but that doesn't help. So clinicians, when they apply results from randomized trials to patients, they have to think whether this patient is similar to the patients in the randomized trial or not. And if you don't think you make mistakes, like uh, those people who didn't treat, uh, for example, in COVID time, what kind of patients benefit from them this year, for example? They applied to all kinds of patients and wasted scarce resources at that time, which could have been used more carefully and then perhaps that has been discussed. So knowing which kinds of patients respond to a treatment is important. And uh, that is if patients uh, are such that they fit into the criteria of randomized style, it is very easy to apply. We have discussed that in the previous weeks. Uh, when a patient doesn't uh, fit into the criteria of the randomized style, then you have to think whether to apply this result or not. Sometimes you do, sometimes all of us do. But then you have to think more or harder whether it is right to apply the results of So this is why ideal situation will be when all kinds of subgroups of patients respond to the treatment equally well. Then you don't have to think about it. So that is the reason why we do subgroup analysis. We also do subgroup analysis to find out if one subgroup is helped, whereas another subgroup is marked by the treatment. Even if it is not harmful, if it is not helping, then it's useless to apply those resources to that kind of patients. So it is very important to know which kinds of patients respond to a treatment. So every randomized trial should do subgroup that. Then report if there are genuine differences across the subjects. But unfortunately, what has happened is uh, lots of subgroups analysis turned out to be false perfect. So first example is this. If you have seen this paper came in. 1978, I had joined uh, AIMS in 1980 while I was a junior resident, and I still remember. It was Sunday, and I was on duty in the ICU or, or CCU, and health department then of Malaysia in Colorado. So he is and said, so what is the problem with this patient? So we, we said, this patient had a near myocardial infarction, something like this, something like that. And then he said, what treatment are you giving? So he looked at the treatment and said, oh, okay, so you are giving aspirin. Remember, 1974 was very early days about the story of aspirin. So, why are you giving aspirin? We have read that it uh, helps in preventing the recurrence of myocardial infarction or stroke or cardiac ischemic attack uh, in patients who have had one ischemic <coughs> episode like myocardial infarction. <coughs> so he looked at me and said, Oh, I see. Very good. Where did you read it? So this has come in a recent journal, I think about three years ago. So it must have been 81. He says, Has it working three days? Did you read the paper properly? I was uh, 
taken back. Why? Why should it not work with females? <laughs> but I had not read that paper. So I came back and read it. See what it says. That uh, for a spin reduced, I'm, I'm reading the F flat and the second para. I do. A spin reduced the risk of continuing ischemic attacks, stroke, or death by 19%. And also reduced the risk of the harder, more important events of stroke or death by 21%. This effect was sex dependent. Among men, the risk reduction for stroke or death was 48%, whereas well, no significant trend was observed among women. You see? So, uh, he must have read it uh, properly. So, he was saying, ah, you are sure it works in women. And uh, when I went back and read it, I thought, oh, it is a mistake. How many of you think it doesn't work in people? Uh, I think there's a catch. It should be postmenopausal women or premenopausal women for the risk reduction. Uh, so, uh, what is the average age? I don't know. Most females must have been. I think uh, most females must have been uh, postmenopausal. But uh, still, now, uh, do you think? Somebody, even even menopausal, um, stays comes with uh, some ischemic event. You don't give aspirin. What is happening now? Are we giving or not giving? We are giving. 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 So males uh, and females are getting it equally because subsequent studies have shown that actually this difference was. And this, this is just one of several examples where people have done subgroup analysis like this and this wrong conclusions. And then uh, it has given a wrong idea to the medical practice. Like then the Department of Cardiology, he lived it and he wanted to practice it. This is, this is a problem with the subgroup analysis. And this is a pervasive problem. This, has, uh, this was one of the first. Uh, and then subsequently, I will tell you how many examples are there where subgroup analysis saying that it was in this subgroup but not in that subgroup turned out to be wrong. So often wrong that people wonder. Why are we going so wrong? And then devise some criteria and look here. We should trust only those subgroup analysis which meet certain criteria. The other thing you might recall is we discussed in previous sessions that uh, effect measures are of two kinds. What are those? One is ratio measures, right? The other is difference measures. These are two categories. From difference, you can find out identity. From ratio, you can find out the relative risk reduction. This is what they are talking about risk reduction, right? So, fundamentally, they are difference measures or uh, ratio measures. We also discussed that when you go to an individual patient and apply the results of the randomized trial, then what does it apply? Ratio measure or difference measure? <laughs> ratio measure, because we remember we said <coughs> a difference of 10% with the deep moon clonal antibody in MI uh, is uh, interpretable if risk is as high as deep. But if somebody has a risk of 5%, then 10% risk doesn't, 10% risk difference doesn't apply. Right? So, but ratio measure is still apply. So if risk reduction is half, then 80% becomes 40% and 5% becomes 2.5%. So ratio measures applies to subgroups of patients. 
and it has been seen repeatedly that uh, it's not only logical but also uh, a consistent finding that these few measures tend to be similar across the surface. So remember this. So when we do subgroup analysis, what should we use? Ratio measure or difference measure? Ratio measure. Ratio measure. So uh, I must tell you that I am using my doctor's slides. She gave a lecture in her institution and I thought it is a good set of slides. So uh, what is this subgroup effect is about? To identify groups of patients who respond differently to different diagnosis. Now you see, he has uh, there is different three different population of three different risk groups. In my example, I have given you two kinds of populations, one with uh, risk of death equal to 60 percent, another one was five percent. Right? Here there are three groups: population one, population two, population three. Mild risk, moderate risk, high risk. So if you see, it is the same relative risk reduction in each one of them, but there is a difference in absolute risk reduction. So absolute risk reduction is 10 percent in the first group, 30 becomes 20, right? So there is a reduction by one third. Similarly, 10 becoming 6.6, one third reduction. Similarly, perhaps uh, there is a risk of 1 which becomes 0.66, so one third reduction. One third reduction is to each one of them. But if you see the difference, the difference will be 10% in one, then it may be 3.6% uh, uh, in another, and maybe 0.66% in another. So that is, that is the same. See, this difference is 10%. Whereas relative risk, relative risk is ratio, risk ratio is 30 divided by 20 divided by 30, which is 0.67, right? The number means that numerator is intervention group, denominator is control group. Control group will have higher rate. So 20 divided by 30 becomes 0.66 or 0.67. Same 3.3%, 10% became uh, 7.6.7%, uh, right? So again, 0.67, one third reduction. Relative risk remains the same, risk difference becomes 0.3%. The same with the risk difference of 1% becomes 0.66%. Relative risk reduction is again one third. <coughs> so relative risk is 0.67. So one third, one third, one third, one third but translates in difference. 10%, 3.3%, and 1%. So if you use difference measure, you will often find a lot of differences across the surface. And that is not your aim. Your aim, as we said, in the ideal world, all patients will respond. All kinds of patients will respond. Then it will be uh, much easier, right? And even in biology, this, this is what happens that relative or uh, ratio measure is relatively constant compared to difference. So for any subgroup analysis use ratio measure, not difference measure. That is the reason. So for example, a new statin suppose reduces cardiovascular death by 50%, which means the relative risk of risk ratio is 0.5. So somebody with a baseline risk of 40% this risk will become 20%. But somebody with low risk with a baseline risk of 2% is uh, most statin use risk will become 1%. Is it clear? So that is another message that when we do subgroup effects, do it on uh, relative or ratio measures, not on so the recovery trial of uh, uh, this uh, COVID, which was uh, published in England Journal of Medicine, as you can see that rate ratio, rate ratio is also a ratio measure. We discussed it last time. You 
point that in point six four indulge in invasive mechanical ventilation. Point eight, those who are non oxygen only. No oxygen we save one point one nine. Overall it is point eight three. But if you remember, I think finally uh, the idea was also based on other studies that only patients who are at least receiving oxygen should give a sleep. Right? Those who are not on oxygen, there may be uh, there is uh, no effect or some, some tendency of heart and breath. So better not to use the required those who don't require oxygen. So, interest is in relative, not absolute subgroupings. That's the message, right? We, whenever we do subgroup analysis, do it in relative or ratio measures, not in difference measures. Uh, okay, we will come to this thing later on. But look at another example post menopausal hormone therapy and risk of cardiovascular disease by age and years since menopause. So, you can't read this, but uh, at least the right hand side you can read. If HRT is used soon after menopause, it appears effective for CHD. If it is used years after menopause, it appears to be a risk factor for CHD. So, basically, depending on the subgroup, you have different effects. Uh, another example will be for MMR vaccination. Uh, we and the recovery trial using this monoclonal antibody, which has now become available, uh, and particularly in patients who didn't have their immune response. If you take all participants, there is no effect. You see, uh, right hand side, rate ratio is 0.94, uh, p value 0.17, no effect. If you look at the subgroups, which is those who are zero positive or zero negative. Zero positive, no effect, rate ratio 1.09. But those who are zero negative, there is effect, rate ratio 0.8, which means p value, uh, value of 0 0.001, which is uh, statistically quite significant. That is that is what became the rule for applying this monoclonal antibody cocktail uh, for patients who are admitted with COVID 19. So, subgroup is, uh, is important. It's not that you shouldn't do it, but you should do it with caution. There are other things which we need to keep in mind. Same thing is shown here as well. And uh, you remember this is a mistake which was done. So this mistake was caught when there was a collaborative interview of randomized trials of all kinds of patients, and that subgroup effect which the radial study had found was not there. There was another trial which was very big trial, ISIS 2, I think it was just instructor no aspirin, aspirin versus this. Overall mortality in those who received aspirin after myocardial infarction was 9.4 percent. In placebo group, it was 11.8 percent. How much is the difference? Difference measure is 2.4 percent. But uh, relative risk reduction is 23 percent. Right? That is. Because you take 9.4 divided by 11.8, you get this ratio, then 1 minus that in percentage it will give you 23 percent. Then they did a subgroup analysis. Subgroup 1, there was aspirin had higher mortality, 11.1 percent, as compared to placebo 10.3 percent. Subgroup 2, it was 9.26 percent versus 12 percent, 8 percent reduction, increased risk with the subgroup one. So, if you did a subgroup analysis, you would have thought, uh, you would have concluded that 
we should use this aspirin in which subgroup? And not in subgroup. Then they published how are these subgroups made, right? These subgroups <coughs> were made and it is published based on zodiac sign. Zodiac sign, you know? <laughs> so those who were Gemini or Libra, they were actually subgroup one. And those who had other astrological signs, they were subgroup two. So they are recorded this symbol based on obviously the date of birth. This is what they found, right? So the message they gave is that if you do subgroup analysis, you will find many false positive results. And therefore, you have to be very cautious. And obviously, some Indian explorers would have thought this is true. <laughs> this is, I told you that zodiac signs make a difference. <laughs> so you should apply only to some zodiac signs. Fortunately, no Indian cardiologist believes it, right? And this is published in uh, Lancet, 1988. They want to read. Just to highlight how subgroup can be misleading, they have published this. Many other examples are there. We are we talked about aspirin. Similarly, there was a subgroup analysis in one of the earlier trials. Anti-hypertensive for primary prevention in ineffective in women, ineffective only in men. Absolutely uh, wrong. Anti-hypertensive treatment, ineffective or even harmful in elderly. Those who studied with me, uh, which means in, uh, some the 70s, they will remember this is what was even taught to the students. That it is good to treat high blood pressure, but if somebody is very old, they need higher blood pressure to push the you know, blood to the brain, therefore don't treat, right? The subsequent trials have shown that was wrong. But actually it was taught to students that very elderly people should not be treated because their blood pressure is small, there will be less pressure gradient is there so many things and uh, that was again another long interview. Beta blockers again not effective in elderly after acute myocardial infarction. You know, after acute myocardial infarction, people use beta blockers again. I think this was ISIS one of ISIS two study which said that this uh, prevents sudden death. Yeah, but they said it doesn't help elderly, again proved wrong. Thrombolysis for acute MI is ineffective in previous in patients with previous MI. So if you have second MI, it doesn't work. This was the uh, based on subgroup analysis. Absolutely wrong. So we can have many, many examples where this has been this has happened. Therefore, they said we must exercise cost. What cost can we exercise? First cause of free exercise is that there should be some biological rationale for doing something. There is no biological rationale for Gemini or Libra sign responding differently from other astrological signs. So we should not believe. It. First thing is there should be some biological rationale. Second thing is that uh, second cause we take is. Don't do too many subgroup analysis. In one study, which is published in stroke, last time in a huge stroke study, they didn't find any effect of the rest. Then they did, I don't know, they never said how many subgroup analysis they did. The inclusion criteria was, I think, up to 48 hours after stroke, 24 hours, I don't remember. But then they started doing subgroup analysis. Those who came within one hour, those who came within two hours, those who came within three hours, like that. And at one point, there's one oh, statistically significant benefit. At seven hours, there is statistically significant benefit. So they published it also that if you use racetime to those who came within seven hours, then it helps. Obviously, uh, many criticisms were written against this finding, and then nobody. It. So 
So they try to replicate it. They did another trial called PASS2. Okay. So they dis <laughs> disproved their own circumference. This is this is why uh, it is not used in no guideline treatments using less than nucleus. Then the replication should be the gold standard. Yes, yes, the application is the gold standard. So group uh, analysis can be done as hypothesis generating exercise, which will be tested in another study. So that is uh, that is another very important caution we say that don't do too many subgroup analysis. Clinicians uh, have this temptation. If we are not finding anything, then do one, then the second, and the third, and wherever you find PhD students do the same, residents do the same. Somewhere they will find out p value less than 0.5, this they will report. But sir, it is also like, true for the recent monoclonal and antibody for dementia. It did not show analysis, but in a subgroup it was shown. <coughs> I think in policy makers of Kitun Pharma also pushed it. Yes, Pharma company will push it. They spent so much money on developing the treatment and then study did show anything. It's a huge loss for them. They want to do some subgroup analysis and at least convince some clinicians to use it. And uh, uh, then, of course, uh, when they try to replicate. So that is false positive. False positive. Do the subgroup analysis. Yes. So do a few subgroup analysis, not so many, so that you increase chances of uh, what we call false positive. Then we also said that do subgroup analysis comparing the right numbers, right? So, for example, suppose I say that people in this side of the hall, their average height is, let's say, 6.5. On that side of the hall, at least it is let's say 5.5. Now, if it is statistically significant, you can always have a subgroup. Say, no, 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 let us compare between only males uh, across each other and females. But when you compare this, you compare the difference, not the mean height uh, across the subgroups, but the difference between the subgroups. In other words, you have, for example, anatomy, right? Those who come regularly for dissection, they got 70 percent. Those who are 70 percent passed, and those who don't come for dissection, 50 percent. So there is a difference. Dissection, attending dissection, makes it that is the conclusion. And somebody says, no, no, it depends on the gender. Just do male and female differences. And you find that in males, the pass rate which you found is 20% difference between those who are ten and those who are That becomes 30% difference if you see in males, but it becomes 10% difference if you see in females. Right? Maybe females, uh, they study a lot and they compensate for not attending the Whatever be the reason. Now, so don't do analysis separately. Of course, you can do separately for males, separately for females. But what do you compare? You compare not within each one and separately and conclude something. But compare if there was 30% difference, 30% versus 10%. Is it statistically significant? So, in males it is 30% difference, in females 10%. So let's compare. Is 30% and 10% difference is statistically significant or not? Depends on the number. That is called test of, uh, we can call it test of subgroup differences. Not subgroup test. Subgroup test is you compare it with females, compare it with males. That is separate subgroup. But when you compare across the subgroups, then you compare subgroup differences, 30% versus 10%. That is, 
should be called just for certain preferences, which is given another name or test of interaction. This is a statistician's name. We don't like it because we have a different idea about interaction. We think of drug interaction. But they have different idea about interaction. So when you compare this subgroup differences, not within the subgroups, between the subgroups, they call it test of interaction. So do test of interaction, not just looking at p value across two groups. So that is another thing which people said should be lesson from what we have seen. Then there is uh, another criteria that <coughs> when you do it, use relative measure, not absolute measure. See how big is the effect, right? So, if the difference is huge, and p value less than 0 0.001, that is more likely to be true rather than false positive. True positive is more likely than false positive. We were doing, another lesson is, we were doing a meta-analysis where there was a study from Japan, there was a study from China, there was a study from USA. And we found that there is, in Japan, uh, it was a study of the, the lower dose of thrombolytic drug than standard. Japan, they found effect. Particularly in those patients who came within three hours of right? That even low dose is as good as standard. In the US, they didn't find uh, this difference. So uh, they said that beyond three hours, three to four point five hours, both. Not find any difference. Within three hours, they found a difference. So the question was uh, sorry, the study was like this. Within three hours in Japan, but in uh, US, the study was between 3 to 4.5 hours. Right? So 3, .4, 3 to 4.5 hours, no effect. Within three hours, effect in Japan. So, people concluded that if you do within 3 hours, it has effect, but 3 to 4.5 hours, no effect. This was a comparison of Japanese study versus American study, right? And it is under the assumption that patients who were in the American study were similar to patients in the Japanese, Japanese study. Then only you can compare. So that is between study and study. So those who know methodology, they said, no, this is a wrong comparison. What you should do is, Japan should also do a study from 0 to 4.5 hours. Compare within 3 versus 3.3 to 4.5 hours. And US should also do a study within 3 hours, 3 to 4.5 hours, and then compare the difference across the study. If you take subgroups in one study versus another subgroup in another study, it is unacceptable. But within a study, if you compare, it is acceptable. That is what is called within study comparisons is recommended. Between study comparisons are not recommended. Or at least it will be not likely to be true. And uh, Another criteria which we use is that any variable you take should be before, should be measured, should have been measured before randomization other than after randomization. After randomization, treatment starts. So any differences which you see should be attributed to the uh, study drive other than something which is biologically uh, right. So, pre randomization data variable for making subgroups, not the post-randomization. Like post-randomization, you remember the compliance uh, story I told you, that those who complied, those who didn't comply, there is a big difference. 
right? It may be related also to the treatment as well as disease. So better not to take a subgroup after randomization. Any subgroup should be formed on the variable measured before randomization. So these are the precautions which people are taking. Maybe there are many slides to show the same thing. But uh, uh, since I have to leave, I think uh, just remember these important points. One is that do few subgroup analysis. Use test of interaction, not only within subgroup test, across subgroup test, test of interaction. There should be biological plausibility for you to, so it should be pre specified. When you are writing the protocol, you should write. That is why uh, we call it research planning and reporting. When you plan your study, you write down what subgroup analysis you will do. So pre specify. That is more value because you will specify based on some biological. So it gives more assurance. Please specify rather than after the study, which is called post hoc. Post hoc subgroup analysis is not trusted. So please specify rather than post hoc. It should be large effect difference, large difference rather than small difference. It should be based on pre randomization variable rather than post randomization variable. And it should be within the study subgroup rather than between studies. Right. These are the criteria which you use before you trust any subject. Any question? No question? Then we can stop here because I have to go a bit early today. <laughs> uh, I wanted to go earlier and